My name is Rowan Brownlee and I work for the Australian National Data Service, otherwise known by its acronym ANS. I'm based in Canberra at the Australian National University. In the previous webinar in October, we heard about the aims and activities of the core vocabularies program and development of the resource type vocabulary. There was a discussion as what is, of what is meant when we use terms like taxonomy, ontology, controlled vocabulary and thesaurus. There was also a discussion of the value of vocabularies in supporting metadata quality and repository interoperability. Speakers in the previous webinar also talked about how the core vocabularies are being made available online for machine and human access. It's this last part, the topic of access for reuse, which I'll be focusing upon in this webinar. Firstly, I'll take an example of what might be described as a classical vocabulary and illustrate how it may be expressed in SCOS. This will involve an overview of the origins of SCOS. Then I'll discuss the flexibility of the SCOS vocabulary, how it may be extended or combined with properties and classes from other RDF vocabularies such as DC and OWL. Then through the lens of the ANS vocabulary service, I'll talk about tools for creating, managing, publishing and accessing vocabularies. Then I'll talk a little about vocabulary registry interoperability. Along the way, I'll mention the Australian Vocabulary Special Interest Group. This recently formed group, known by its acronym ABSIG, has as one of its areas of focus the topic of getting started with vocabularies. It's great to have tools and technologies and we also benefit from plain language guidance and support. Before talking about how SCOS may be used to publish vocabularies, I'll first mention some of the reasons why vocabulary publication is a good idea. Many organisations use published vocabularies or develop and maintain their own, and these vocabularies are a key component of their information systems. Galleries, libraries, archives, museums, also research organisations. Australian examples of research organisations which use vocabularies include the Commonwealth Scientific and Industry Research Organisation, or CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, the Integrated Marine Observing System, and Geoscience Australia. Many vocabularies are developed to support the needs of a particular organisation's systems or a network of systems within a particular domain, such as a library network. However, the purposes for which these vocabularies were developed remain relevant within the context of the internet. A controlled vocabulary helps to improve the precision of results when searching an indexed collection. Hierarchical and associative relationships help when browsing collections. When published online, controlled vocabularies become accessible resources rather than locked up in a specific institutional system or accessible only to members of a particular network, these vocabularies become available for direct access and reuse. Publishing a vocabulary makes it more visible. And visibility may assist a domain community to discuss whether multiple similar vocabularies are really needed. As an example, Geoscience Australia are publishing a considerable number of vocabularies used by that organisation. It's likely that other organisations in the same domain have their own versions of these types of vocabularies. As more organisations publish, publish their vocabularies, might there be options for consolidation? There may be good reason for choosing one domain vocabulary over another, even if they are quite similar. If that is the case, that's fine, and relationships can still be expressed between similar or identical concepts in different vocabularies. This mapping of vocabularies assists users to traverse pathways across separate collections, which may be indexed using separate but aligned vocabularies. Vocabularies are also important to the idea of the semantic web. The semantic web entails the expression of precise and meaningful statements about resources. These precise and meaningful statements include expression of a resource's conceptual aspects. Controlled vocabularies reflect agreement on terminology for labelling concepts. When there's agreement on common language for concepts, then the discovery, linking, understanding and reuse of resources is improved. 
As an example, the Australian Integrated Marine Observing System publishes data and metadata which includes terminology from marine vocabularies. These vocabularies are used by international initiatives such as ODIP or the Ocean Data Interoperability Platform and enable data collected in Australia to be shared and understood more widely within the marine community. If you're going to publish a vocabulary, it helps to have an agreed and supported model. Just as a vocabulary is an extension of agreement on meaning, a community standard is an expression of agreement on how a vocabulary structure will be expressed. SCOS is an example of a model which provides a simple means to enable vocabulary access and reuse on the internet. And a great strength of SCOS is its simplicity. If we agree that the controlled vocabularies are of value and that there are good reasons for publishing vocabularies on the web, how then should they be published? What model should be used for expressing the typical features of a vocabulary? The web ontology language, otherwise known as OWL, predates SCOS, so why not use OWL? OWL provides a formal and precise means of representing domain knowledge. OWL enables a great deal of detail to be recorded about a knowledge domain, including rules and axioms, all of which in combination provide a basis for complex computer-based reasoning. Creating an ontology using OWL can involve quite a bit of work if there's a lot that should be modelled. It can take considerable domain expertise. Controlled vocabularies are not necessarily formally precise representations of domain knowledge, rather they are more like informal structures reflecting the intuitive knowledge of human users in a form useful for resource discovery, such as through supporting query expansion. They don't have the complexity that requires the expressiveness of an ontology language. Because they're less formal, less precise, it can take considerable work to translate a vocabulary to OWL. If done incorrectly, conversion of a controlled vocabulary to an OWL ontology may introduce misleading logical precision. As an example, a vocabulary may use a broader term relationship indicated by BT. BT may indicate a generic, partitive or instantial relationship. The way in which BT has been used by the thesaurus may not be documented. Even if there are policies governing how BT should be used in developing the thesaurus, these policies may not have been uniformly followed over time. In one of the papers which I reference at the end of this presentation, the authors discuss Agrivoc and it provides an example of some of these issues. Here's a quotation. The Agrivoc thesaurus of multilingual agricultural terminology, the product of many people working over many years from multiple perspectives, was straightforwardly converted into a hierarchy of OWL classes many years before the finalisation of SCOS. While the maintainers of Agrivoc in OWL intended to increase its ontological precision over time through editorial correction and refinement, it eventually proved to be more practical simply to convert Agrivoc back into the formerly less committed form of a SCOS concept scheme, leaving it to the designers of specific implementations to upgrade parts of the thesauri into class-based ontologies when required to support reasoning. Rather than seeking to capture every possible characteristic of every vocabulary, SCOS focuses on typical features of many vocabularies. The developers of SCOS wanted to ensure compatibility between SCOS and existing thesaurus standards. SCOS therefore reflects the standard thesaurus construction principles. It was intended to be able to be used and understood by people who already used and understood vocabularies. In using SCOS, they wouldn't need to model an ontology to publish a vocabulary for use by people and software. SCOS was intended to provide a low-cost migration path to the semantic web. In the previous webinar, Timo provided definitions for a controlled vocabulary, taxonomy and thesaurus. Each of these can be represented using SCOS. The emphasis here is on taking a simple approach a simple model that expresses the key features of controlled vocabularies should have a greater chance of being used and supported. Here is an example which expresses typical properties of a thesaurus. 
concepts, relationships between concepts, and documentation guiding how a concept should be interpreted or applied. In the case of this thesaurus, animals, cats, and wild cats are preferred, and domestic cats is non-preferred. The thesaurus creator has also decided that cats is equivalent to domestic cats, and that cats should be used instead of domestic cats. It may be that the thesaurus creator sees cats and domestic cats as synonyms, or that the further specificity of domestic cats is not required, and that it is instead sufficient to only use the broader term cats. There are other relationships between concepts. Cats has, as a broader term, animals. There is also some sort of associative relationship between cats and wild cats. Wild cats cannot be a type of cat, since cats covers domestic cats only. Since someone who is interested in cats may possibly also be interested in wild cats, an associative relationship is expressed to assist exploration of the subject. Next I'll illustrate how these typical properties may be expressed using SCOS. In SCOS terms, CATS is a resource which is of type SCOS concept. SCOS concepts have labels, including preferred labels and alternative labels. In this example, the preferred label is CATS and the alternative label is domestic CATS. This use of PREF label and ALT label is equivalent to the earlier USE and USED FOR relationship of CATS and domestic CATS. SCOS can also indicate the language of a label, in this case, English. A SCOS concept may have many preferred labels, but at most one in a particular language. In this example, we see the French and English language preferred labels for the concept animals. And this feature supports multilingual search. SCOS expresses the type types of hierarchical and associative relationships found in a traditional thesaurus. Animals is a broader concept to cats, and wild cats is related to cats. Here we see the original thesaurus extract and SCOS version together. The SCOS concepts, their labels, relationships and documentation. In SCOS terms, a vocabulary is a concept scheme, an aggregation of interrelated concepts. Two properties from the SCOS core press specification which support the expression of a relationship between a concept and a concept scheme are SCOS in scheme and SCOS has top concept. These properties, not shown on this slide, provide a means of asserting that a concept is contained within a concept scheme. It can also have a way of saying that a concept is at the top of a concept hierarchy. SCOS supports the assertion of relationships between concepts that are in separate concept schemes. In this example, concept scheme 1 has animals, cats and wild cats. Concept scheme 2 has a concept animal, which is judged to be sufficiently the same as the animals in concept scheme 1. Because they are the same concept, it is reasonable to, to assert an exact match relationship between animal and animals. Because these concepts enjoy an exact match relationship, it is also reasonable to assert that cats from concept scheme 1 has a broader match with animal from concept scheme 2. Apart from broad match and exact match, SCOS also provides narrow match, related match and close match. Here is an example of mapping using the agricultural vocabulary of Agrivoc. As of early December 2016, Agrivoc had been mapped or aligned with 16 other vocabularies. Some of these are general thesauri and others are environmental or agricultural. Some of these are displayed on this slide. The column to the right displays the type of mapping and the number of concepts mapped. Many of these are major vocabularies commonly used in collection indexing. This mapping of vocabularies assists users to, tra to traverse pathways across separate collections, which may be indexed using separate but aligned vocabularies. Here's an example of a SCOS concept from Agrivoc. The concept is cattle. In this part of the display, we can see broader and narrower relationships, preferred and alternative labels. 
there are also quite a few preferred labels in languages other than English. Agrivoc is a multilingual vocabulary. Further down the page, we see mappings to other vocabularies. There is an exact match mapping between cattle as a concept in Agrivoc and equivalent concepts in these other resources. We also see the concepts URI, or Uniform Resource Identifier. A SCOS concept has a URI which identifies that, which identifies that resource on the internet. It enables interaction with the resource through use of specific protocols, in this case HTTP. If I pasted that URI in a browser window, I would see this HTML page. If a software application was accessing this URI, it could instead request the concept description in a structured format suitable for machine processing. Formats such as RDFXML, Turtle or JSON linked data. URIs are very important. In this example, the concept ID is C underscore 1391. The concept ID is that very last piece of the URI. A concept ID like C underscore 1391 is opaque. There's nothing about that ID which would prompt me to think, ah yes, that must mean cattle. The vocabulary creator could have instead decided to use a semantically meaningful identifier Instead of C underscore 1391, they might have used cattle. But then what would happen if the preferred label changed? At best, the URI may become misleading or confusing as it would appear out of sync with the preferred label. Also, in a multilingual thesaurus, which language would be chosen for a semantically meaningful concept ID? In designing a URI pattern, it is worth considering the use of an ID which has no semantic relationship to the concept that it is identifying. In this example, it is also useful to examine other parts of the URI. Agrivoc is produced by the Food and Agriculture Organisation, and the URI contains that organisation domain. But what would happen if the organisation changed its name? <coughs> Here is an example, another example of a URI pattern. This is a concept from the school's online thesaurus. The example concept has the preferred label arts. In this case, the concept ID is opaque, and unlike the case of Agrivoc, the organisation name forms no part of the URI. Schools Online Thesaurus is produced by Education Services Australia, or ESA. Rather than use ESA in the URI, they use curriculum. Education Services Australia could change its name or its URL, and this change would have no impact on the concept URIs in the Scott Thesaurus. In contrast to a business name, the term curriculum is enduring, and it also communicates something about what the company is doing in this domain. Organisations change their name, but URIs should not change, and if a URI changes, existing links break. These are some areas that I've talked about so far. SCOS concepts have labels. Concepts may have hierarchical and associative relationships within a vocabulary. Concepts within one vocabulary may be mapped to concepts in other vocabularies. Concepts are organised into concept schemes using SCOS properties such as in scheme and top concept of. Concepts are also identified using URIs. Now I'll talk a little about how SCOS concepts may also be grouped into collections. This is an extract from the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus. At the top level of this extract is the subject Nails with the qualifier Fasteners. Immediately beneath that is Nails by Form, and you'll see that Nails by Form is surrounded by greater than, less than brackets. Below Nails by Form is an alphabetic listing of nails. This alphabetic sequence continues until we see another heading within greater than, less than brackets. This time, nails by form, head type. And then, as before, another alphabetic sequence of nails. Within a thesaurus, groups of concepts which have a common parent may be organised into arrays. 
Node labels are thesaurus entries which indicate how the concepts have been grouped. The concept nails, fasteners, has many narrower concepts. One option would have been to display one single very long alphabetic list. AAT instead uses nodes to help with navigation, browsing and display. Nodes are not concepts, rather they are used to group arrays of concepts, providing further guidance to users of the vocabulary. In the AAT example, members of an array are ordered alphabetically. Other ordering methods could be used, such as some numeric sequence. Alternatively, an array could be unordered. Arrays can also be nested. In this example, the array labelled Nails by Form has a subarray labelled Nails by Form Head Type. This use of nodes and arrays provides an additional means of organising concepts within a thesaurus. It helps people navigate this thesaurus by breaking up a potentially very long list of narrow terms into further categorised groups of terms. So too, the SCOS collection can provide another means of expressing relationships between concepts within a thesaurus. In this example, nails by form could be a collection label and the narrow terms below it, members of the collection. They are still narrower concepts of nails fasteners, but they are also members of the collection. Here is another view of how SCOS collections may express the structure of nodes and arrays. In the AAT example, the node label nails by form is a type of guide term Guide term is a class defined within the Getty ontology. A guide term is a subclass of a thesaurus array, which is also a class within the Getty ontology. Thesaurus array is, however, a subclass of a SCOS collection, and the node label, nails by form, is a label for a SCOS collection. Back to the thesaurus view where nails by form is a label for a SCOS collection which has member concepts including barbed male nails, box nails and Chinese nails. Nails by form head type is a SCOS collection nested within the nails by form collection. In that previous example, we could see an instance of classes and properties from the Getty ontology being related to SCOS classes and properties. The Resource Description Framework, or RDF, supports combinations of classes and properties from different vocabularies. In this example, SCOS is combined with Dublin Core terms. DC expresses date of creation, name of creator, and version. There is an RDF type property indicating that this type of resource is a SCOS concept. RDF makes it easy to combine RDF vocabularies and SCOS was designed with this in mind. The developers of SCOS believed that there was no need to define properties and classes where it was possible to reuse those from existing and widely used RDF vocabularies. Why define a SCOS class for creator when DC already provides one? Reuse of existing RDF vocabularies also assists with interoperability. If a community is already using DC, then it is known and understood. If I use DC, it is likely that systems implemented by that community will know how to make sense of the DC that I provide. I'll mention at this point that the term vocabulary is itself overloaded. There are vocabularies like Library of Congress subject headings, which are full of descriptive concepts. There are also RDF vocabularies like SCOS and OWL and DC. In both cases, it makes perfect sense to combine I might combine concepts from LCSH and Schools Online Thesaurus to adequately express the conceptual aspect of a resource. I might also combine classes and properties from various RDF vocabularies to adequately describe the resource. Apart from combining SCOS with other RDF vocabularies, SCOS was designed to be able to be extended to meet more specific needs. I mentioned earlier that rather than seeking to capture every possible characteristic of every vocabulary, SCOS focuses on typical features of many vocabularies to provide a simple and low-cost migration path to the semantic web. 
For some domains, SCOS is insufficient. For example, the statistics community have defined extensions to SCOS to meet the requirements for expressing statistical classifications. XCOS, an extension of SCOS for the statistical community, includes several dozen additional properties, including additional semantic relations. Here's an example from XCOS which follows the SCOS recommended practice for defining extensions. In this case, the XCOS community wished to record more specific types of information than that which is catered for by a SCOS scope note. Two additional note properties are defined as sub-properties of the SCOS scope note property. These new sub-properties are inclusion note and exclusion note. In addition, core content note and additional content note are sub-properties of the XCOS inclusion note. Although all of these types of notes could be recorded as SCOS scope nodes, the type of each note would then be lost. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to understand which scope note is the inclusion note or the exclusion note. SCOS provides guidelines on how to define extensions in a way that provides support for the more granular and specific needs of particular domain communities, while retaining compatibility with applications which are based on the core SCOS features. SCOS itself has been extended in the form of SCOS XL or SCOS extension for labels. In SCOS core, labels are properties of concepts. Labels cannot be described any further. Relationships cannot be expressed between labels. A label doesn't have a URI, a concept has a URI, and a label is a property of a concept. In SCOS XL, a label is a resource. It has a URI and can be described with properties and relationships. SCOS XL includes label relation. This is a super property for applications defining their own relations. An example provided in the documentation concerns full form and acronym. FAO is an acronym of Food and Agriculture Organisation. In SCOS Core, FAO may be an alternative label for the full form, but SCOS does not provide a means of documenting this type of relationship. SCOS Excel supports the definition of a relationship, such as through uh, is acronym of, to explicitly assert that FAO is acronym of Food and Agriculture Organisation. At the time SCOS was developed, there was a discussion of, about including a set of label relationship types. The developers decided to leave this to an extension activity as they didn't believe that they'd come up with a, they themselves would come up with a comprehensive set of relationship types. So far I've talked about SCOS, its development, how a vocabulary may be expressed in SCOS, and how SCOS may be combined and extended. Next, through the lens of the ANS vocabulary service, I'll talk about some tools for creating, managing, publishing and accessing SCOS vocabularies. The ANS Vocabulary Service is called Research Vocabularies Australia, or RVA. RVA helps to create and manage vocabularies. They can publish a vocabulary in formats that are usable by people and machines. This means that I can browse a published vocabulary through a web user interface, and I can use RVA to draw vocabularies into my local systems for use within my organisation. RVA also helps to make the vocabularies more findable, more visible, as information about the vocabularies is harvested by Google. RVA provides a means of editing existing vocabularies or creating new vocabularies. The Pool Party Vocabulary Editor is a user-friendly web-based tool. It outputs SCOS, but I don't have to know much about SCOS to use it. Here is an example of a vocabulary. The left-hand pane shows the vocabulary's hierarchical structure. The right-hand pane shows details about a highlighted concept. And it is a straightforward process to create concepts and to express relationships between them. 
I can easily define a URI pattern and the software will implement this pattern as each concept is defined. In this example, I have a base URI and then each concept is individually identified by addition of a running number. Pool Party generates these numbers. I don't have to be concerned about SCOS syntax. I can define concept labels, set relationships between concepts and document concepts and the editing software creates the underlying SCOS. Here are a few examples of SCOS editors. Most of these are commercial and VocBench is an open source product. It's good to have user-friendly editing tools, whether commercial or open source. I was recently talking with someone from an organisation which has repeatedly encountered problems maintaining vocabulary management systems which require highly technical knowledge on the part of the vocabulary creator. On to vocabulary publishing. RVA also provides a means of publishing vocabularies. RVA has a workflow that enables authenticated users to pull in a vocabulary from the ANS instance of Pool Party or to publish a vocabulary which has not been managed within Pool Party. In this example, I've chosen to draw in a vocabulary from Pool Party. This shows the metadata editing page for a vocabulary titled AODN Platform Vocabulary. AODN is the acronym for the Australian Ocean Data Network. Some of the metadata is pre-populated from the file drawn in from Pool Party. This includes title, description, creators and publisher. This is the view of the RVA publishing portal showing the published vocabulary. We can see what the vocabulary is about, license conditions for reuse, how it may be accessed and previous versions. In this example, access options include file download and access via application programming interface. We can also see that there are four earlier versions of the vocabulary, version 1, 1, 0.2 and 0.3. In this example, the publisher has chosen to create and release versions and has also decided that earlier versions may remain available for use. RVA supports choice regarding versioning and access to current and superseded versions. At this stage, versioning is at the level of the vocabulary as a whole. And ANS is intending to explore options for managing finer grained versioning, such as versioning at the concept level. Hosting and publishing vocabularies requires technology for storing and providing access. Sesame provides a framework for hosting and providing query access to vocabularies published through the ANS service. Queries can be made using Sparkle, which is the generic RDF query language. Sysfoc is used to provide a linked data API. Sysfoc was developed to provide an API that matches SCOS, that is aligned with the structure of SCOS. These endpoint templates allow a general user to explore a SCOS vocabulary without having to know the details of the Sparkle query language. SysFoc is part of the Spatial Information Services stack developed by CSIRO, or the Commonwealth Scientific and Industry Research Organisation. In the references at the end of this presentation, I've included a link to a paper describing SysFoc's origins and design. Although ANS doesn't use SCOSMOS, it is an example of a vocabulary publishing platform that is well worth mentioning. SCOSMOS has its origins in Finland. In Finland, there was a law passed in 2011 concerning interoperability of information systems in the public sector. It required that everyone should work with agreed definitions. The law appeared, but the actual terminological work had not been undertaken, and so there followed considerable project activity. Given the National Library of Finland's previous experience in providing access to information through descriptive metadata, they were identified as the agency best placed to work in the area of descriptive interoperability metadata. The Finto project focused on the publication, development and use of controlled vocabularies to serve the whole of the public sector, including memory institutions, government, as well as media and research. It has been quite an undertaking and I'm sure much valuable experience has been learned and expertise developed. 
experience and learning, no doubt, of interest to those involved in core vocabulary initiatives. Scosmos is a vocabulary publishing tool used by Finto, providing a vocabulary access for humans and machines. In the links at the end of this presentation, I'll include a paper describing work undertaken by the National Library of Finland to convert traditional thesauri to SCOS, as well as another paper giving background on SCOSMOS. On to vocabulary discovery. RVA helps to make vocabularies more discoverable. The metadata from the RVA publishing portal is harvested by Google. I can search Google for marine platform vocabularies and find the AODN example. The AODN platform vocabulary is hosted and published by RVA. Google points me back to the landing page for the vocabulary. I can see what it is, what it is about, access conditions and how to get access. Because the vocabulary is hosted by RVA, I can browse the vocabulary through the web portal. RVA provides information that helps to make an informed choice about whether the vocabulary may be suitable for my purpose. On to integration. I've talked about how RVA services can be used to support vocabulary management, publication and discovery. RVA services can also be integrated with local services. As an example, the Australian Ocean Data Network, or AODN, has a portal which provides access to marine and climate science data. Not surprisingly, the AODN portal uses AODN vocabularies. If the vocabularies are hosted by ANS, how do they end up in the system that drives the AODN portal? The answer lies in the fact that RVA provides a technical means to draw vocabularies into local systems. Access can be provided by an application programming interface, a Sparkle endpoint, or a widget. As an example, AODN edit and publish their vocabularies using RVA services. When a new version of a vocabulary is published, the AODN portal uses the RVA machine interface to get hold of it. This publishing workflow allows AODN to focus on their core services rather than having to maintain additional services for vocabulary creation and management. They use AND services to maintain their vocabularies and to get access as needed. Apart from an API and Sparkle endpoint, RVA provides a widget which may be incorporated into a web form to provide data classification capability to local data capture and description systems. The widget has a number of configuration options including search, autocomplete and browse a hierarchical tree. There's also a widget explorer where you may try out the widget using vocabularies hosted by and service. I've talked about the RVA components and the AODN example provides an illustration of how those components can work together. Editing in Pool Party, publishing to the RVA portal, integrating with the AODN portal via RVA machine interfaces. But that's not the only way to use the RVA services. The RVA services can be used separately or in combination. And here are a few possible examples, all of which are valid. I know of a vocabulary which I want more people to know about. In, in, this is in the first example. Uh, in this case, I can describe the vocabulary in the RVA portal, and this, the description can include a link to wherever the vocabulary is published. In the second example, I want to edit a vocabulary using Pool Party, and I also want to publish that vocabulary to the RVA portal so that others may access and reuse it. In the third example, I want to publish a vocabulary and make it accessible for reuse. I don't want to use the Pool Party editor. I already have tools for editing my vocabulary. And in the fourth example, I want to edit a vocabulary. I'm not in a position to publish it. Maybe it will become publicly accessible or maybe it has to remain in-house. I don't know at the moment, but I want to get started. So in these examples, I don't have to use the editor to use the publishing portal. And I don't have to use the publishing portal to use the editor. I can edit a vocabulary and choose not 
to make it publicly accessible. I can upload a vocabulary to the publishing portal without using the ANS editing software. The RVA portal and machine interfaces are accessible to anyone. Anyone may use vocabularies published in RVA according to the license conditions outlined in the description of each vocabulary. The Pool Party Editor, as licensed commercial software, is available to Australian research organisations, including collecting organisations, government agencies and universities. Next, I'll talk about uh, vocabulary registry interoperability. Anecdotally, it appears that activities are increasing regarding publishing of vocabularies in structured format for use by people and machines. Here are a few examples of organisations and initiatives that are either routinely providing access to vocabularies or are in the process of developing services. ANS has an interest in interoperability and how various registries may relate to each other. As an example, RVA supports search for vocabularies and individual concepts. I can search RVA to find out if there are any vocabularies in RVA whose descriptive metadata contains the terms that I've searched on. This search will also retrieve concepts whose labels contain one or more terms that I've searched on. But what if I could search a registry of vocabularies and discover not just vocabularies hosted by that service, but information about vocabularies hosted elsewhere? Another example concerns the ANS vocabulary widget. It has been developed to work with vocabularies hosted by ANS, but would it be feasible for it to work with vocabularies hosted by other registries? Could I drop the ANS vocabulary widget in a web form and have it retrieve terminology hosted by CORE? A further example concerns the ANS vocabulary browse interface. Each vocabulary hosted by RVA has a page of metadata and a navigable browse tree. I can point and click to drill into a vocabulary and have a look to see if it may suit my needs. This is an example of a vocabulary which is described in RBA but not hosted by RBA. The descriptive metadata was copied and pasted from the core site and the top concepts were manual input as text. This vocabulary cannot be browsed further via the RBA user interface. But what if I could browse the core of vocabulary via the ANS web interface, even though the core of no vocabulary is not published by RBA? ANS is planning to provide API access to registry metadata. This will allow our partners to push vocabularies and descriptive metadata to the ANS service without needing to manually input via the RVA user interface. They'll also be able to use the API to edit existing RVA metadata. Perhaps there are options around harvesting descriptive metadata from other vocabulary registries for inclusion in RVA. This would certainly lessen the maintenance task involved in keeping descriptive metadata and links up to date. Finally, I'll mention the Australian Vocabulary Special Interest Group. ABSIG was established a few months ago and is intended to provide a forum for discussion and activity concerning vocabularies. Although it is an Australian group, anyone from anywhere is welcome to join. Membership is open to anyone from Australian and international research organisations, including universities, research institutes, collecting organisations such as libraries, museums and galleries and government agencies. Membership is also open to people from commercial organisations. ABSIC has a quarterly video conference and there have been some good presentations so far. We record presentations and make the videos along with meeting discussion notes available online. Although supported by ANS, the group's direction is intended to be driven by its members. People identified a number of areas of interest and this helps in organising discussions and events around those topics. One of these areas of interest is in learning and training, getting started in vocabulary creation and ensuring good practice. And I'll shortly be calling for expressions of interest from ABSIC members to work on this area of learning and training. 
Here are some links relating to uh, some of the issues that I discussed in the presentation, and that concludes this presentation.